Well, good afternoon. We are going to get started with this breakout called Embracing the Tension. So it's post-lunch, so if you fall asleep, it's okay. It happens to all of us at some point. Hey, but uh, we are going to cover, I'm going to try to cover three of the main tensions that I believe leaders face right now in culture. We may just get to the one, which is the word and spirit. Um, so you should have a handout in front of you. I talk really, really fast, so you're going to need that to keep up. Uh, but I want to pray and just that God will saturate your heart and kind of leave you here with something as you walk out. Father, we just thank you for this conference. We thank you for Pastor Lee and his heart just to see healthy, praying, strong, word and spirit churches. And I pray for this next few moments that you just impart in us a desire to embrace the tension between the word and the spirit, between our current reality and the future reality, but also unity and truth. So Father, I just thank you for wisdom and discernment and anointing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, quick short story, I'm the pastor at Christ Chapel. I've been there for almost eight years. My wife, Toya, is here with me. Went there in 2014. It was an existing church that we would call a spirit church. We spent the last eight years trying to bridge that to be a word and spirit church with failures, with successes, with mistakes, but with a lot of, a lot of lessons that have been learned. And so a lot of this is from some of those lessons. In Ezekiel 22, it says this, I look for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. Standing in this gap, so gap is a, a hole between two different places. So there's two extreme, extremes or opposites or two things that are there. And what I found is the kingdom of heaven, the truths of the kingdom of heaven are found in the tensions between two things. And so when you see some of these things, you'll see this. Some of the tensions are grace and truth. They seem like opposites, but when you can embrace the tension between the two, you grab a hold of the tension and the truth of the kingdom of heaven. Justice and mercy seem like polar opposites, but when you embrace the two, you get the truth of the kingdom of heaven. God's sovereignty and human responsibility. When you embrace the tension, you get the truth of salvation. You keep going on and on, the natural and supernatural, word and spirit. Come and see and go and tell faith and works, the kingdom now and the kingdom later. Evangelism and discipleship, they seem like opposites. But when you can embrace the two together, you get the truth of the kingdom of heaven. And the sad thing about the majority of church world is we don't embrace the tension. We just grab a hold of one and then we fight the other. And so when you do that, you actually lose the truth because the truth is actually held in tension. And in the scripture in Ezekiel 22, he says, I look for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap. The gap is where the tension is between the two things. So whether it's the word in spirit, whether that's evangelism and discipleship, and what I found is it's much easier to just go one way or the other than to hold that tension and stand in the gap. But the scripture is saying God is looking for people He's looking for leaders who are willing to grab a hold of both sides and bridge the difference, grab a hold of the tension and stand in the gap so God can build the churches he's wanting to build. And so that tension is difficult, that tension is painful, because the reality is the tension hurts. And so God is looking for leaders right now, right now that can embrace the tensions of the kingdom of heaven, whether that's human responsibility and God's sovereignty. We've seen people choose camps, whether they're Reformed or Arminian, they're choosing, but God is both. God uses both for salvation, whether that's faith and works, the word and spirit. He's looking for leaders that are willing to hold on to the tension, and the tension is where the pain is. I heard Pastor Lee share some of the stats that he was going through, just the pain that, that pastors feel. That is the tension. And so the easy way to explain it, if I can have Steve... And if I can have you, I just want you to stretch this stretch Armstrong. So if it busts, though, it's on you. So if he was wearing skinny jeans and Jordans, that would be a pastor. But if you, but if you just hold it. So if, if this is the word side and this is the spirit side, people on both sides are fighting each other. If you look at political divides, they're fighting each other. If you look at sovereignty and human responsibility, they're fighting each other. And pastors who are trying to stand in the gap feel the tension. And so the tension that we feel many times, the discouragement, the pain, the frustration, the doubt, the stress, the anxiety, is because we are the stretch Armstrong in the church. The leader carries the tension of the church, trying to bring them closer together. And you never actually release the tension. You just find ways to embrace it 
in order to do what God has called you to do. You can set that down before you break it. <laughs> and so a, a few quotes. Sam Chance said, you'll only grow to the threshold of your pain. So meaning the amount of pain you as a leader can embrace and can hold determines the level of the, or the size of the growth of the church that you can accomplish in trying to bridge that gap. He also says when, you want to, when God wants to make a difference, he raises up a leader. Every time in the Bible, we may pray, God, we want you to move. God, we want you to do this. Every time God moves in the Bible, he raises up men and women of God to use to move something forward. And those are people that stand in the gap and begin to bridge that gap to bring those two sides closer. The leader is the one who embraces the tension of the church. The church doesn't embrace the tension. They may feel the tension, they may feel the pain, they may feel the frustration, but the leader is the one who holds that tension. And that's why pastors are stressed out, that's why pastors give up, because they, they see the tension, but they feel the tension, and they hold the tension, and it's expressed through anxiety, it's expressed through doubt and discouragement, stress, all the things we see. And one of my, my philosophies of leadership is leadership is frustrating people at a rate they can handle. So if you have people on the word side, people on the spirit side, I'm trying to frustrate both of them at a rate they can handle to get where we're trying to go. When you're trying to move people from Egypt to the wilderness to the promised land, you can only lead them at a rate that they can actually hold on to and accomplish. And so you're always frustrating people, but you're frustrating them at a rate they can handle because frustration is a sign you're moving them out of their comfort zone. And so when you're embracing the tension, you have to know people will be frustrated which is causing tension with me, but it's actually moving our church and our movement forward. And so the three major tension areas, I think, is, is first and foremost the word and the spirit. So if we're going to be the churches God has called us to be, leaders have to be people who embrace the tension between the word and the spirit. This is extremely vital. You, you heard it this morning. People aren't just looking for a good message. They're not just looking for a good teaching. They're looking to be encountered by the presence of the living God. So if you're just a word guy, you're, you're detrimenting your people from an, an encounter with the presence of God. But if you're just an, a presence person, they're missing the foundational truth to actually grant them freedom and the boundaries and the truth of God's word. One of my mentors, R.T. Kendall, said it this way. He said, there has been a silent divorce in the church, speaking generally, between the Word and the Spirit. When there's a divorce, sometimes children stay with the mother, sometimes with the father. But in this divorce, there are those on the Word side emphasizing sound doctrine, especially Romans, and those on the Spirit side emphasizing the Holy Spirit, especially the book of Acts. Sadly, it seems to be one or the other almost everywhere I go in the world. The need is for both. I believe the simultaneous combination will result in a spontaneous combustion. The Word and the Spirit coming together will bring about the great next move of God, of the Holy Spirit. And so we all know, we, we can identify most churches based off their, if they're a Word church or a Spirit church. Word churches are usually Reformed churches, maybe Baptist churches, Presbyterian churches. They have great doctrine, great theology, great teaching, great preaching, but they lack the presence and the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Then you have churches on the other side that are so spirit-driven, they never break up with the Bible. Everything's a word from God. Everything's a gift of the Spirit. Everything's an altar call. And they lose the foundations of the faith that have been around for 2,000-plus years. And so when the two come together, it'll bring about this move of God. But the only way it comes together is for leaders who can embrace the tension and actually start bringing the two back together again. And so that tension is what we're going to be talking about right here. So we need both the Word and Spirit to be the churches Jesus is looking for in His return. So Jesus is not just looking for a church. He's looking for a specific type of church, a church that's without blemish, without spot, that is pure, that is blameless. And I believe it takes the Word and the Spirit both to be that type of church. And the problem, like we said, is people choose one or the other. And Steve Morell, founder of the Every Nation Movement, he says it's the two ditches. One is the ditch of weird, and the other is the ditch of dead. <laughs> Meaning, we've got burned by the things of the Holy Spirit, so we don't want any of the Holy Spirit, so then you end up in the ditch of dead. Or, you're so into the things of the Spirit, that now you're over in the weird stuff. And we first caught the, the chapel, there, was, there were in a huge prophetic church. And we had a kid in the youth ministry, a prepubescent 15-year-old. I asked him, what are you reading in your Bible? He tells the pastor, 
I don't read my Bible. I'm prophetic. If God wants to tell me something, he'll tell me. I was like, huh. And so everything was like that. And so what had happened, they got into the ditch of weird. Now, the temptation of a leader in order not to embrace that tension is to just overcompensate, then get into the ditch of, of dead. And I, and I did that for a season where I was so burnt out by the prophetic, so burnt out by the gifts being manipulated and used for, for pride and ego and selfish ambition that I, I started oversteering. I actually went to a prayer meeting in Nashville and had a, there's a prophetic guy there. And that night before, they said, hey, uh, Jim Critcher's here. He's got some words uh, uh, in season he's going to give out. And I was like, I don't want any of it. I'm about to leave. I, was, I don't want to deal with anything prophetic. Like, I've gone to a hell in a handbasket in the prophetic. And they told me, hey, we don't do that here. Here's our protocol for the prophetic. If somebody has a word, we record that word. So we want to judge that word and hold on to that word. And so the next morning we go. And you know when you're the new guy in a prophetic meeting, you're always going to get the word. So I was already nervous anyway. And at the time, my wife had been sick. She's actually in a wheelchair. We're going through all this chaos and this church transition. And this prophetic guy just reads my mail. And it was one of the most encouraging words I'd ever had in my entire life. Then a few weeks later, by the church, it's still just chaos in the church. She's still sick. We've got four young kids. And this, this lady calls the church and says, hey, my cousin's a minister, and she wants to come by and talk to you. When well, the South, everybody's cousin's a minister. And what they're saying is they want to come over and ask for money. And I was like, look, tell them I'm busy. I'm tired. I'm stressed out. Just tell. She said, well, she's already here. She comes in. It's this large African-American lady who's unkept. I'm just judging her. I'm just waiting for her to ask for the money. And she begins to prophesy. And she begins to prophesy. God told me, he said, I brought this lady all the way from Chicago, Illinois, to encourage you. Just shut up and listen. And she read my mail. She encouraged me. A few weeks later, I found out she's Donnie McClurkin's intercessor. She's B.B. and C.C. Winans' intercessor. And, like, I had no idea who she was. She just, God brought her there. And God awakened me to not oversteer back in the dead, but to embrace the things of the spirit again in a safe way. And so what happens is we all have the temptation to move towards our default. If we're word people, we want to oversteer the word. If we're spirit people, we try to oversteer to the spirit. But you have to embrace the tension is what keeps you going straight down the road. When you get loose, you default to one way or the other. And what happens is when you have the word minus the spirit, your church will become legalistic or a fundamental church. You see that with, with tons of denominations that are now, they're super fundamentals. If it's not this way, there's no grace, there's no, no love, no mercy, no power, no presence, because they've lost the spirit. Then you have spirit minus word equals liberalism. Right. So we kind of had where we're at where it's all about how I feel and, and what I need and, and my emotions and a lot of emotionalism, but there's no anchor for the faith. <laughs> then you have no spirit plus no word is just carnal Christianity meaning it's about my carnality, my flesh. There's nothing to suppress that at all. But word plus spirit equals New Testament Christianity, which is, I believe, what Pastor Lee was talking about today, where it's presence-driven, centered around the presence of God, proclaiming the gospel, living out the gospel, and becoming the people of God to minister to the world around you. We're no longer in an attractional season where people will come to us. We have to carry the presence of God with us wherever we go. And so God is looking for these type of people. In Mark chapter 12, it says this. It says, Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. So he's talking to the Pharisees. He's saying, this is why you're wrong. You don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. So not only do you not know the spirit, but you don't know the, the word of God either. And he's saying these two things should be the same. They should be tied together. And so what happens is that word error means to wander off track or astray. So what he's telling them is you had the word and you had the spirit, but at some point you wandered off track. And he was trying to get them back, off, back on track to be word and spirit. Church, when you're ignorant of the scriptures, here's what happens. Our faith is weak and limited because faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. When we're ignorant of the scriptures, we cannot walk in true freedom because freedom comes by abiding in God's word. When you lack the knowledge of the scriptures, we have no boundaries to, and we live according to our own ways because all scripture is given for reproof and correction and rebuke. And so when you're ignorant of the scriptures, you have no boundaries to live from. But when you're ignorant of the Holy Spirit and the power of God, we have no power to live the lives God has called us to live. We have no real victory over sin. We experience limited and circumstantial peace. 
We experience no lasting joy because joy comes through the Holy Spirit. We have no spiritual gifts to advance the mission. Our prayer lives are weak and powerless. We experience no spiritual growth or progress and sanctification, and we don't have an assurance of salvation. So when you're ignorant of one of those two, you end up with those limitations one with the other. But the question we need to ask ourselves is this. We must ask ourselves, how well do I and my church know the Scriptures? Right, so Jesus says the two sides of error is going to be not knowing the Scriptures, being ignorant of the Scriptures, or being ignorant of the power of God. So how well does my church know the Scriptures? Then secondly, how well does my church know the dunamis, which is the same word Jesus used, or the power of God? So just thinking to yourself, if Jesus is telling you, how well do you know the Scriptures? How well does your church know the Scriptures? Yeah, they know your preaching. Yeah, they know your sermons. How well do they know the Scriptures? And then secondly, how well do they know the power of God? Not a good worship service, but how well do they know the presence and power of God? Because we tend to stray towards one or the other. And to get where we need to be, it says this in 1 Thessalonians 1. It says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and the Holy Spirit, but full of conviction. We have to come to a place where we realize we can't have one without the other. That our ministry is only truly authentic when it contains both the word and the spirit in equal respect. So we have to get to a place where we respect both the word and the spirit. That means one of the things I've had to do is realize that just because a church isn't a spirit-filled church doesn't mean I can't respect them as being a word church. And just because a church is a spirit-filled chaotic mess doesn't mean I can't respect them for honoring and respecting the things of the spirit. So when I respect at least that side of it, I can start building bridges to embrace the tension to bring us all closer together. One of the first things I did going through a chaos is there was a Reformed church in town that is like the John MacArthur, all the gifts of the Spirit passed away. He's the fundamentalist. I scheduled lunch with him. I scheduled lunch with him because he was really the only church in town that was still a word-centered church. And I knew that if we were going to be a word and spirit church, we had to build some connections with word churches in spirit churches. So I scheduled lunch with him. His first words were, what do you want? Charismatics don't invite me to lunch. I was like, well, this is not going well. <laughs> so we go through. I said, man, I just want to say thank you for, for keeping the word centered in our community. Like you're, you're the word church. And I just want to say thank you for, for being that anchor point here in our community. And it, it just set him free. He was like, really? I've never had charismatics like invite me to lunch before. Like usually they're condemning me and all this stuff. And so we start talking about the gifts of the spirit. And when I would describe pr- pr- prophecy, he was like, I think I agree with that. I described tongues, he said, I-, I think I agree with that. And it was like one morning, I said, you know what, you're about to be a charismatic. And he said, don't you ever say that again. <laughs> but on the same way, it was with the spirit-filled people, I had to build bridges. What happens is, until you respect both, you don't get either one. Right. And we live in a day and age where we're so busy trying to build our camps there's the scripture in Mark and in Luke where the disciples come to Jesus and they say to Jesus, hey, hey, they're baptizing people in your name. And Jesus says, who cares? Now, the context of that is Jesus only chose 12 disciples and they were with him. They're the ones complaining. So these other disciples that are baptized are rogue disciples. And Jesus still says, I don't care. If they're baptizing people in my name, they're not against us. And we have to come to a place, if we're going to be word and spirit people, that we need to acknowledge if they're a word church Thank God they're getting the word out. If they're spirit churches, thank God they're empowering people with the, of the power and the gifts of the presence of the Holy Spirit. But we're going to be people that respect both and achieve both. And so we want to be the book of Acts in balance. Paul is the word guy and the spirit guy. When you see him in the book of Acts, he's literally, he writes two-thirds of the Bible, but yet he writes the Bible and tells us what the gifts of the Holy Spirit should be and how they should operate. He is the word and spirit guy. If you want to be a word and spirit church, just look at Paul and do whatever Paul does. And so we maintain the traditions of both the scriptures and the New Testament teaching while also moving when the spirit moves. So one of the things we tell our people, they'll say, well, are we a word church? Are we like a charismatic church? I'm like, we're a word and spirit church. When we do prophetic presbytery, people ask, well, are we a prophetic church? No, we're not a prophetic church. So we don't want to be identified by a gift. We want to be identified by the presence of God. So we are a spirit church. And so you have to fight because most people have never seen a word and spirit church before. 
They've seen their Baptist church they grew up in, or they've seen TBN and Charismania, and so they don't understand. And so we have to be better at communicating why we are that. And so you'll experience seasons where the pendulum swings between being a word church and the spirit church. So it's not like a perfect balance of 50-50 where this Sunday we're 50% word and we're 50% spirit. You're never going to obtain that. What you will obtain is catching the rhythms of the wind of the Holy Spirit, where the winds of revival will, will sw swing through and, and move into the things of the Spirit, and then that'll die down to get you grounded back in the Word of God again. So there'll be these rhythms, and so you have to learn as the leader to embrace that rhythm and that swing of the pendulum in order to embrace that tension and be the Word and Spirit church. And so some application for you to create a Word and Spirit church is this. Create language to explain and relieve the tension of the people in your church. So they don't know how to explain the tension. They'll feel the tension. That's why they'll say, you know, are we, are we a charismatic church? Are we, are we a Pentecostal church? And you have to create language saying, listen, we fully, fully respect the Word of God and the traditions of the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed. We, we completely embrace that and revere God's Word. But we believe when we look at God's word and we dig deeper in God's word, it always points us to the things of the spirit. Yes. And then when the Holy Spirit comes, and like, well, we're a charismatic church. Yes, but the Holy Spirit should always point us back to the word of God. And so uh, we actually, on Easter Sunday, and the pastor of the room will understand this, on Easter Sunday we had a tongue and interpretation, which is the last day of the year. You want to have a tongue and interpretation. Like my first thought was, God, why? And so we, were, we debriefed it, and so the way we handle that, that doesn't happen often. It happens maybe once a year, and it just happens on Easter Sunday. That when that happens, we want to go right back to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. So we don't want to make it a spirit thing. We want to make this is a word thing, right? So if we can connect the two together, it moves us closer to being a word and spirit church. But if we're just like, praise God, you hear that God is moving, and you just get into the spiritual side, you miss the word. And so where that came important to me is, is that, I think it was our first or second year there in Florence that we had a tongue interpretation on Sunday morning. Again, it only happens like once or twice a year. This guy's a visitor, African-American guy. He schedules a meeting. He says, hey, well, I'm, I'm the Sunday school director of this little small black church. And he goes to this whole store and he says, do you mind if I'm coming to church here? I said, man, you can come to church anywhere you want to. We'd, we'd love to have you. And he says, hey, that tongue thing. So most pastors know that means he's ready to debate. He's already said, I'm Baptist. I'm a Sunday school teacher. Like, I'm ready to debate. I'm getting all my scriptures ready. Don't, I'm getting ready. He just says, that was beautiful. I'm like, but no, we, we got to debate. Like, you, we got we to we gotta argue. Like, and he's like, no, that was beautiful. And then that's when I realized many times when we come from Pentecostal movements or charismatic movements, we're actually embarrassed of the things that are actually beautiful. And because we've never seen them done in a way where, hey, when the Spirit moves, let's go back to the Word. So we're always tying the two together. And so three things you can do to bring the things together and be closer in that tension is, one, emphasize the Word. R.T. Kendall's one of my mentors. He tells me if you have to hang your trousers because he's British, if you have to hang your trousers on something, hang them on the Word of God. Right, so if something has to give, lean into the Word of God. And so some things you can do is make the Bible your resource. That means for your governance. That means for your decision-making. That means for your staffing. That means for everything. Make the Bible your resource. Not church growth movements, not even Radiant, not anybody else you know, not your mentors. Make the Bible your resource. If it's not in the Bible, don't do it. If it is in the Bible, do it. Make it your resource. But two... Find a time to just preach through a book or a chapter of the Bible. So if you're in a, on the spirit side, this is going to help move you the other direction. Whether that's a chapter, you take Hebrews 11, or you take Philippians 4, you take John 3. You just say, hey, we're going to dig in God's word. And what it does, it communicates to your people that we're not just a spirit church, we're a word church. And the deeper you go in the word, the more room the Holy Spirit has to move. And then choose a Bible reading plan and get your church to use it and talk about it. We push at the beginning of the year, this is our Bible reading plan, this is our Bible reading plan, this is our Bible reading plan. We want our people to know we are a Bible-first church, but we are going to center our church around the presence of God. So you've got to emphasize the Word, and two, you've got to emphasize the Holy Spirit. So if the Bible is your main resource, make the Holy Spirit your main source. Different thing. A resource gives you knowledge. A source gives you power. 
And so the Holy Spirit has to be your source, not your spiritual gifting, not your own preaching ability, not your marketing. The Holy Spirit has to be your source for everything in your church. Two, get your team and your church praying. So we've talked about that. Pastor Lee is saying, hey, we have to be praying churches. The problem with that is most of us have never been in a praying church before. And so we don't really have a model. That's what's beautiful about this here this weekend is that we have a model that you can take with you. But one of the things we tell our church is we're not going to do anything on Sunday morning we don't do as a staff throughout the week. So our staff meeting, we worship, we pray, just like it's Sunday morning. Why? Because that's what's filling us up for Sunday morning. And you have to get your church praying, however that may be, Wednesday night prayer meeting, daily prayer meetings, Sunday morning intercessory prayer. One of the things I do that I, I'm the most proud of, I think, of our church is every Sunday morning, we take time to have intercessory prayer. Over a prayer component, we're getting our people to pray, and then we pray for our local church by name and the pastor by name. And the reason for that is while we're trying to build these bridges between the Word and the Spirit, most churches are fighting over the Word or the Spirit. So we're trying to stand in that gap to, to, to build those bridges. But two, it communicates to our people that we're not, a, we're not a competitor with these churches. We're trying to help each other churches. And we've watched God move in incredible ways through that. Go back to an altar call in some way that lay hands on each other and pray for people, especially for the sick. That's the easiest way to communicate that we're a spirit-filled church. We believe in healing. We believe in the laying on of hands. And when people see that, it changes their perspective from this being a service to this being an experience. Prophetic presbytery is one of the greatest things we've done at chapel. I never heard of prophetic presbytery until I came to Radiant four years ago. God told you the story. Prophetic chaos was where we were at. Like It was just out of order, out of balance. There's no word. I'd read about prophetic presbytery. I came to Radiant, and I saw one, um, I think it was Wayne Drain, Tom Lane, and Tom's daughter was here, I think. And I was blown away, and I was deeper than Pastor Lee. I said, what do you think? And I said, I almost felt like an outsider. I felt like this was a family meeting, and God the Father is coming, sitting in the meeting to encourage the family, and I'm not part of the family. I felt like a stranger watching like his family meeting going on, and I said, it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And so I said, we have to do this. We, we have to do this to get our church back in that balance between the Word and the Spirit. And so we did prophetic presbytery. This is the most healing thing I've ever seen done in our church. And our elders, so we, our, kind of our process was we, we have people in our church, on our staff, that nominate people they think need prophetic ministry, going through a transition, uh, maybe promotion in ministry or leadership, gone through a difficult season. And so we nominate those people. The elders then confirm those, that list. We send that list with no names, just candidate one, candidate two, to the presbyters. They come to prophetic ministry. After they leave and after it's all over, the elders sit down with each and every one of those candidates, and we go through that word. So one, it's judging the word. Two, it's giving accountability to the prophetic uh, presbyters. But three, our elders are actually walking in an eldership, walking these people through a spiritual gifting, and it was just a, such a pastoral moment that it brought, one, it brought pastoral care back through our eldership. But two, it brought the power of the prophetic into our church in a way that's aligned with the Word of God. And then School of the Spirit or, or any type of, of education or teaching or discipleship that empowers people in the gifts of the Spirit. Like, I know Pastor Lisa, we're at this place now where as your church grows, at some point, you can't just keep preaching on the Holy Spirit every single month or every single quarter. At some point, you need a, a continual, consistent way to get people connected and embracing the gifts and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because one of my fears is that we'll at some point have more people who are not spirit-filled than we do that are. And when that happens, we're no longer a spirit-filled church. And so you have to find some way to do that. We got time. I'm going to keep on going. The second tension is this. Leaders must embrace the tension between now and next. What that means is everyone in your church is just thinking about right now. They're just thinking about this Sunday, their moment, their week. But leaders think about now, but also next. And that causes a tension between what you're currently expect, uh, currently your current reality, but also what you're dreaming about and what your vision is. And that tension drives stress. And so leaders have to do both. And so every pastor is a visionary. Every pastor is a dreamer. Every pastor is wanting to see things move forward into that promised land. But the stress happens when you're in the wilderness trying to get to the promised land. 
The people are stressed out, you're stressed out, and you're the one holding the tension between the two. And this is a principle that, that I live by. Is It's called organization, organizational gap. And what that is is you always have to maintain a gap between where you are and your personal growth and the growth of your church, your organization. Because whenever that gap closes up between your growth and organization's growth, once the organization outgrows you, you are no longer the leader. Once your spiritual growth is capped out, now you no longer have the spiritual influence in your church. Somebody else does. And so you have to constantly, intentionally outgrow your church. So you're not just called to lead your church. You're called to outgrow your church. You're called to think ahead of your church. And the, and the easiest way to see this is Moses. We think of Moses, this great leader who leads the people of uh, the Hebrews out of Egypt into the wilderness and the promised land. But where did, where did Moses come from when he came back to Egypt? He came from the wilderness. So he left Egypt. He spent 40 years on the backside of the desert, the wilderness that God was using that wilderness season for him to learn the land, to navigate the land. So when he came back to Egypt, he's leading them not into a place unknown, to a place he spent 40 years. And so what happens is you can't lead people to a place you've never been before. The reason Moses couldn't go into the promised land, he'd never been to the promised land before, but Joshua had. So there, there's a principle there that until you go somewhere, you can't expect anybody else to follow you there, whether that's in spiritual gifting, whether that's in knowledge, whether that's in leadership. And so for you to hold that tension, you have to make sure that you are purposely out praying, out learning, and out growing everyone else in your church. That is your calling as a leader to make that happen. So some of the tips is one, schedule regular next thinking. In your, in your weekly schedule, schedule time, this is what I'm thinking about what's next. But also schedule your personal growth. What is your Bible reading plan? What is your book reading plan for the year? Is there a conference like Rise Shine or another conference you can go to? Because once you stop growing, the church stops growing. Once you stop growing, you actually stop leading because your growth is what is leading people forward. Find people that you can connect with, your Bible reading plan, books to read, people to connect with, courses to take. One of my favorite biographies is George Washington Carver. His aunt said this, learn everything you can and come back and give it to your people. Learn everything you can and come back and give it to your people. As a pastor or leader, learn everything you can about God. Encounter God daily and then come back and give it to your people every single Sunday. And then last but not least, leaders must embrace the tension between unity and diversity. Now, this one is, is complicated in, in our culture today because everything's divided, everything's polarized. We want unity. There's a blessing on unity, but it's hard to get unity. But at the same time, diversity is a core value of most people. So you have these two things that are conflicting, diversity and unity. And the problem is we think of unity as conformity instead of diversity. Actually, unity and diversity are the same exact thing. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There's no male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, the problem with that is diversity is a gift to the church, but it's also a curse to the leader. Right? We all want diversity. We want diversity of giftings. But you know what's going to happen? That prophetic person's mad because you're not giving them priority over all the other gifts. Or the person with the tongue and interpretation is upset because you're not giving them priority over the person with prophecy. And so the gifts are diversified, but everybody thinks their gift is the most important gift. Also, when you have different ethnicities or races or generations, everyone thinks their perspective is the most important perspective. When in reality, you need all perspectives to actually get the right perspective. And so it's a blessing because the more diversified you are, the more gifts you have available to advance the kingdom. But at the same time, it's a curse because the leader has to hold attention between all those different diversities. It makes it hard. It makes it complicated. In this day and age, with our church being a diverse church, every political cycle is hell in the church. And it's, it is not even an ethnicity thing. Now it's everyone's, and Pastor Lee talked about this in our last Zoom forum, on a book called um, The Liturgy of Politics, is that people now get their spirituality from the politics instead of getting their politics from their spirituality. So as a leader, you have to help people, one, deconstruct their fake idolatry and help them rebuild a theology of the kingdom. 
And so the way you do that is you have to destroy the idols that are in our culture. The idol of, of, of race, the idol of, of gender, whatever the new term is that people are identifying their own genders based off of, the identity of po- the idol of politics, the idol of Fox News, the idol of CNN, the idol of whatever the next conspiracy theory is. All these idols, you have to tear them down because you can only build the kingdom up as you tear down the idols. And so my goal, and we've had, man, we've had, um, what's the place in St. Louis, the first major Ferguson. We had the Ferguson thing. And, and so we're a diverse church, so I have to hit it head on. Then you have the election cycle. Then you have Black Lives Matter movie. You have all these things that keep happening. And so every time I can't shy away from them, I have to hit them dead on. Right? Because there's idols all the way around us, and we're here to advance the kingdom, not politics. We're here to advance the kingdom, not race. We're here to advance the kingdom, not genders. And in the kingdom, in order to do that, you have to offend both sides. And so my goal is to, sometimes ungrace, but gracefully offend the left and the right. Because the kingdom is not on either side. And so if I want to have unity, I don't point to one way or the other to get conformity. I point to the kingdom. What does Jesus want? What is Jesus' church about? What is the kingdom about? What is this? And so if I want that unity where the gift and the blessing is commanded by God at, I as a leader am the one that carries the tension. Whether that's in, in, in gender, like we are very, we believe in women in ministry, we empower women in ministry, and we have to fight for that. We have to fight to maintain that. Because we live in the South, people see that, they think it's wrong. The whole Beth Moore thing, people blew up our social media. Then the black and white thing, we're diverse. We're not a black church, we're not a white church, we're a kingdom church. And you have to keep fighting those tensions, and it becomes more and more stressful stressful but the blessing is you get the unity on the other side unity is not given it's fought for and as a leader you can do that some tips to help you do that one is this be proactive not reactive if you wait till the news cycle happens and you react to whatever happened you're already behind you got to be ahead of the curve and be prophetic in preaching ahead of time so when the stuff does happen you've already got there that you're cutting them off at the pass to celebrate diversity. It's a gift. It's a gift to the church. Paul literally said there's a diversity, a variety of gifts. There's a variety of perspectives. It's a gift to the church. Celebrate it. Celebrate. We have women in ministry. We have men in ministry. We have teenagers in ministry. We have black people, white people, Hispanic. We do a, a unity and a diversity every, every year in February. One year we'll focus on African American history. The next year we'll focus on all the different uh, ethnicities or nations that are represented in our church while we're trying to show our church we're special like God is doing something special by bringing people from all across the nation to worship Jesus here Jesus is the centerpiece in our church but then you reward unity so the, the way we do that is that diversity Sunday is in the south it's either black church or white church and so the people that are black give up a lot more to come be a part of chapel than the people who are white. They're giving up a style of preaching, they're giving up a style of worship, and they're giving up relationships because the black family, the black community is filtered through the black church. So many of them will actually get dismissed from their family by being part of our church. So we try to reward them with that Diversity Sunday to show them, hey, we value you, we thank you for your sacrifice for what God is doing here. So you want to you reward that. You want to seek understanding and not conformity. Meaning I'm not going to sacrifice my values, but I do want to understand your perspective. Yeah. And so that's conversations. We, we had, again, the political cycle. There's one of our lay pastors who's an African-American guy. His wife was posting crazy stuff on social media. Like, if you're supporting Trump, you're a racist, you're this, you're this, you're this. And I'm like, man, I've been fighting way too hard. I had to call him and say, hey, listen. I don't care what, what your political belief is. That is not okay in the kingdom of heaven. And you have to fight those things and maintain those values. My value is not political. My value is kingdom. And you have to communicate that over and over and over again. Then seek a diversity of gifts, perspectives, and generations. Make sure you're not building your own kingdom, but you're building God's kingdom. And you know you're building your own kingdom when everyone sounds like you, looks like you, dresses like you, and acts like you. But you know it looks like God's kingdom when everyone looks different with different giftings. It takes, I'm not the most prophetic people, but there's people in my staff that are much more prophetic than I am. There's people in my church that are more prophetic than I am. 
I'm a Bible teacher, but there's people that, that have a greater understanding of theology around me. You want people that have different gifts around you because it makes the church better. But it seems like we want people to look like us because it makes us feel better. One, it relieves the tension, but two, it kind of boosts up our ego because we have a bunch of mini-me's running around. And then last but not least, don't try to be something you're not. Uh, one of our frustrations is when churches, because the, the church growth cliche is we need to be more diverse. And you start trying to be diverse for marketing purposes rather than being diverse because God has called you to be diverse. And, and it, one, I think it's... I think it's arrogant to think we can just we can just put more African Americans on our Instagram and, and and it'll draw more African Americans to our church. It's not about drawing; it's about empowering. It's about empowering people. It's not about even women in ministry. It's not about just having a women's ministry. It's about empowering women for ministry in the church at large. It's not just about teenagers. It's about empowering teenagers to do what God has called them to do now. Like everything's about empowerment, not about attraction. And when you get that part of it, the unity comes and God begins to move incredible ways. But you as a leader, you carry the tension of all of it. And in this day and age, it is harder and harder and harder to manage the stress and the tension of leadership. But I'm telling you, Ezekiel 22, God is looking for someone who can stand in the gap and bridge the gap and embrace the tension to see two things come together to create something more beautiful. We say to our church, we're better together. But it's hard when you're the leader trying to bring those things together. And I believe this week is God is ordaining and anointing people to go back to bridge the gap between the word and the spirit to see God move in a, in a supernatural way. I told you that that prophecy that, that Dr. Kendall had about the, the divorce between the word and the spirit, he gave that in, I think, early 2000s. Somebody came and said, do you know who Smith Wigglesworth is? He said, yeah, now he's in, he's in London, and he gave this word at this conference. They said, do you know who he is? He said, yeah. He said, he gave the same word in the 1940s. He said, went back and literally verbatim, the exact same thing was said by Smith Wigglesworth in the 40s. Dr. Kendall said in the early 2000s about this silent divorce, but when the two come together, it's going to be the most incredible move of God the world's ever seen. And God is calling leaders that are willing to embrace the tension and can handle the tension to be those people that God can move in and through their churches with. So we have a couple minutes for Q&A. Any questions on specifically the tension between the word and spirit in a church? Um, the question was, do you offend the word and the spirit side to bring them back to the middle? I think I have the gift of being offensive myself. <laughs> I try to respect both sides, but at the same time, I'm trying to make them think through what they're missing. If that makes sense. So, so with the word people, so we did the, dealt with this last Frederick Presbytery. So we had a couple that we had actually nominated for candidacy which is, is a huge honor, and it's a great benefit to receive prophetic ministry at Presbytery. And so I talked to the husband. He said, man, I think it's cool. And then the wife was like, no, we don't want to do that. And they actually left the church. Like, they're in candidates for Presbytery, and they end up leaving the church because they didn't want to receive prophetic ministry. And so what the kind of context was, her family goes to a, a very cessationalist church, and so they were involved in her life, and so it would have put tension on her and da-da-da-da. And so Toy actually was able to sit down with her and walk her through the scriptures. This is not just a spiritual gift thing. This is a word thing. And we are a word church and this and this. But if you're a word church, I don't believe you can be a word person and not embrace the gifts and the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit. So I always try to go back to that. So you say you're a word person. Like you want your word, your word, your word. You, you have to take out a whole lot of scriptures in order to validate the fact you don't believe in the things of the Spirit. In the same way, if, you, if you're way on the spirit side and they're like, well, you know, I just, like, we need more of this, we need more of that. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, the Holy Spirit's greatest gift is he wrote this Bible for us to learn, for us to grow. And, and I believe the, the wider and deeper you go in the Word of God, the more the rivers of the Holy Spirit can flow. And so that's kind of how I, we try to offend them 
with whatever their preference is, we use that to bring them to the other side. Anybody else? Uh, so we have green light and red light. We don't have yellow light yet. Green light is like Pastor Marissa. She's highly prophetic. She has a green light. Pastor Anthony. I don't know if he, is Anthony in here. Um, he has a green light. Uh, there's a few people that have a green light. And so they can come. And usually they'll come to me first. Pastor Brian has a green light. They'll come to me, and they can give that word pretty much whenever they want to. On Sunday mornings, we don't let people publicly come to the microphone. But on prayer meetings, we're kind of open that we'll say in a prayer meeting, hey, this is a chance. If you have a word you think it's for everybody, the mic is open. Now, we do try to get them to give it to me first before we release that. Um, now, we have had times where it's just we haven't done that. But we don't do that on a Sunday morning. The tongue interpretation thing, because it doesn't happen very often, we're, we have to, we're redoing our protocol for that because it, it's kind of spontaneous, and we're trying to get that where it's more biblically sound. Yes. Yes. Yep. That's a good question. And James River has a really good process. James River Assembly got it in Springfield, Missouri. They have a host mic, uh, and it's mostly for prayer meetings. And whoever the host pastor is of that service, who's running that service, he has that microphone. And people, if they have a word, they can come to him. But the only people that can come to him are people that have gone through their spiritual gift training and are submitted to that, they have a spiritual gift pastor there. And so the people that are submitted to him are the only ones that can come and give a word. So they, they have a strong protocol. Actually, I like that a lot. Anybody else? Can you describe your gifts to others? Like, do you guys, are you kind of about the same thing? Like, you can say spirit and speak spirit. People ask me all the time, and I'm like, that's the best explanation I have. Yes. Yep, so the question is, what do we kind of identify ourselves with non-denominational Word and Spirit? We say Word and Spirit Church a lot, a whole lot. And, and we probably oversay it because we want, people, we want that to get familiar because, one, you have to create language that relieves the tension. And so when they realize we're Word and Spirit Church, we'll continually redefine that, especially in moments during, um, after prophetic presbytery. Since that was a big swing towards the Spirit, I went right after that into a message on we are Word and Spirit Church. To say, hey, we're going to have some really wide spiritual moments. We're also going to have some really wide and deep word moments. And so that's a term we use because so many people try to fit everything in the box. We don't fit in the box because we're going to move wherever the word tells us to go and wherever the spirit tells us to go. Yeah, so I'll give you some context. So context, that doesn't happen very often. It is very rare, but what was your first Easter? Parker. Parker. So a couple of Easter's ago, we're doing three services. I've done two. I'm tired. Dylan's new. He's, uh, he's sitting up there with me. Before service starts, this guy is like shirts unbuttoned down to his belly button. It's Easter Sunday. He's up front. He's like, let's do this. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So I go down. I talk to him. So my discernment is touch. So if, I can, if I can touch someone, I kind of get my discernment that way. I was like, man, I think he's good. So I go down, worship starts. I'm worshiping. I got my eyes closed. Dylan just hits me. I look up, and this dude is on the platform. We got security guys who have been trained by SWAT. Like, and, and this guy's on the platform like he belongs. And he's just worshiping. And I'm like, oh, no. So I just walk, I'm like, we got security everywhere. I just walk on the platform. I'm 6'3". This dude's like maybe 5'3". So I'm like, buddy, come on. You can't be up here. He says. He very graciously had a conversation with this guy on the stage to get him on. Yeah, because I didn't want to pick him up and drag it. But he said, he said this. He says, if we don't worship Jesus, he dies. I'm like, bro, it's Easter Sunday. He's literally resurrected. <laughs> And so, like, I escort him down. He's still having the conversation. So Easter for us is not always the best day of the year. <laughs> so this Easter, it wasn't anything. It was actually a beautiful word. So Anthony's in the transition. Anthony's hosting. It's kind of a transition moment. The church is packed out. You can't really hear. Music's still going. I hear the tongue way back behind me. So our protocol we want is hear the tongue, 
then ask them to come down to the microphone with interpretation. That's what we want to do. But he goes from the tongue right into the interpretation. And the interpretation was, you are forgiven people, worship like you're forgiven. Right? So it's a beautiful word for Easter Sunday. So the way we want to handle that is, after that, hey, that, that's a word from God. That's one of the gifts of the Spirit that God gives the church to, to magnify His name, to glorify Him, and to want to empower and edify us. So it's in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. You can read because we want to point people to the Word. It's in the Word of God. Read it for yourself. You'll see it. It was happening in Corinth. It's happening in all the New Testament churches. And if you have any questions, you can call us or email us or, or just ask one of the pastors. That's how we want to handle it. Anthony couldn't quite hear it, so he heard it. He just dismissed it. So on Easter, that could be good or bad. So then by the time I get up, it's almost passed away, so you don't want to bring it back up because it's Easter. and are thinking, well, I didn't hear that thing. This church is crazy when you don't have to think we're crazy. So that was kind of the, it was just, don't come to chapel on Easter. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else or anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Some good books. Let me go back. I did leave. So emphasize the word in the spirit. Also emphasize the, the priest or the believer. Pastor Lee kind of hit on it. I believe the, the more you become a word and spirit church, the more the priesthood of the believer is, is empowered. That you start closing the gap between the, the platform and the pew. And the way you do that is give ministry away. Our staff will tell you every step. Give it away. Give it away. Give it away. And some resources for you are some of these books. Leadership Pain by Sam Chan is all about just the pain a leader it feels, it experiences. Uh, Quest for the Radical Middle by Bill Jackson is a book. It's kind of the history of the vineyard movement, and it's their desire to be kind of that Word and Spirit church. It's a great read. School of the Spirit by Pastor Lee. The Word and Power Church is a great book. Word, Spirit, Power is probably the best book to give people who come from a Baptist background but are hungry for the things of the Spirit. All three of those guys are Baptist guys who write the book. So the Word part is written by R.T. Kendall, the spirit part by um, Charles Carn or, or Jack Taylor, the power part by Jack uh, Charles Carn. So they both walk through their process of being filled and experience the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, Word and Spirit by Dr. Kendall's great. Everyone gets to play by John Wimber. Really brings that priest or the believer into, into focus and growing in prayer or growing prayer by Mike Bigel is the best book for church prayer that you'll find by any means. So let me pray for you and we'll get out of Father, we thank you. Uh, just for your bride, for your church. We thank you for her beauty. We thank you for the honor that it is to just be a part of her and to, to walk in her and to lead her and to pastor her. So Father, I thank you for every single leader, every single pastor here in this room. I just pray your blessings upon them, Father. Those experiencing the tension right now of leadership, whether it's the tension of just polarization, the tension of divisions, the tension of stress, the tensions of their current reality and their dreams and their visions, or even the tension between the Word and the Spirit. I just pray that you give them the physical endurance, the spiritual endurance, and the spiritual power to embrace the tension, to bring the two things together, to see revival happen in their church. So I pray for, for peace in their minds and peace in their spirits. I pray for people around them that lift up their arms and encourage them and strengthen them. Father, I pray for revelation of the Holy Spirit. I pray for the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to help them navigate and lead better than they've ever led before. And above all, Father, I pray these next two days that you fill them with your Holy Spirit, set their hearts on fire, fill their minds with your word, and let them leave here on fire and in love with your church. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.